right, hi everyone. So this is the whose future is it? Debating future, oops. And that's what I clicked forward. Um, debating future directions for AI in the enterprise. I'm Ren Lee, um, I'm the SVP of marketing and it is such a joy to see all of you here. And we're going to be talking with our four esteemed panelists. Um, I'd love each of you to perhaps introduce yourself again, just with the photo. Hi, I'm Will Benton. Hi, I'm Mary Marek. <laughs> I'm, I'm Florian. I'm Jed. All right, thank you so much. We have been talking about Gen AI constantly, and there are just so many levels of conversation. This morning, we had roundtables for some of you, and even choosing the area or the layer of this discussion is difficult. And so for each of the panels here, I'd love to understand where is your mind when you're thinking about Gen AI? Gen AI? Like if you were going to dinner tonight and this is the topic you want to, to really hone in on, what, that, what might that be? It's almost certainly the topic that will be happening at dinner because I'm going to be out with a bunch of you guys, so <laughs> that's all. Agreed. To be honest, I spend my whole day speaking about Gen AI, so I'd like to speak about anything other than that. Um, but I probably will end up speaking about Gen AI at dinner. I, I'd be interested in hearing about use cases. I think a really fascinating thing in my own work is that the things that you expect to be impossible are relatively easy, and the things that you expect would be trivial are actually kind of subtle. Mm -hmm. So Gen AI has been sort of fascinating, and I think calibrating our intuitions is useful, and hearing about use cases is a good way to do that. Yeah, I loved what you sort of said around, look, if you're thinking of a use case, the more original that use case is probably a bad fit. And so thinking about, about those use cases and sharing them. Um, also on the floor when I'm speaking to folks as uh, people's feedback has been, that has been the most interesting thing to connect on and the reason why you know people are coming and wanting to talk about um, Gen AI together. So I'm gonna start with, um, you know, perspective from our CEO. So, Florian, if you think about Gen AI, it's supposed to be this big, dramatic, seismic shift, and it is, but we can't quite quantify what that means yet. If you look at the last year, what has really changed and what's sort of stayed the same, actually? I think that what has um, changed Quite a bit is um, all of us moving to, to a state where we, have, uh, we are discovering a new potentially uh, fun consumer application, like talking to a bot, to the realization of some uh, practical use cases in the business. Uh, the realization that some of those use cases were hard, some of them were actually easy, and that you could actually get it done. I think we also moved from a world where uh, there was one provider and one model when we also have the realization that there will be a continuous release of new models and technology emerging and that potentially if you fast forward that from a two years perspective in the enterprise, the technology we will have at our disposal in two years will be very different, more like a zoo of models. And so lots of use cases, lots of technologies means complexity, which can be stressful for all of us, but I, th I think it's also an opportunity for um, accelerating growth. How about you, Miriam? What have you seen really change? And if I think about Titan ML as well, um, it's about three years, mm -hmm. and from starting that company and co-founding that company to today, what are the changes that you're seeing? Well, there are huge changes um, from three years ago. So three years ago, we were working on NLP, as we called it back then. And back then, a 100 million parameter model was considered really big. And now my clients think that seven billion is very, very small. So it's like a complete paradigm shift only in, in about three years. But in terms of what I've seen different from the last year, um, I'll echo some of uh, Florian's comments. One of the biggest ones is that last year, uh, when everyone was looking at their first enterprise use cases, they were looking at ChatGPT and then saying something of, to the effect of, how can I create a chatbot for X? Um, and I think, are starting to realize that actually chatbots are pretty poor first use cases, um, and that actually a lot of the value that is being derived is not from these super sexy, shiny chatbots, but are actually from things that are far more subtle, normally more boring, and normally more ingrained in processes. And that's why we've seen it work much better. So a lot of our clients have pivoted from the chatbot paradigm towards something 
normally more search-based um, or actually properly embedded in, in, a, um, in a workflow. And also, Foreign mentioned kind of the move from one provider, essentially OpenAI, to now um, you know, lots and lots of providers. I made a prediction in September last year that 2024 would be the year of the self-hosted LLM, um, and we're already seeing that. The open source ecosystem is thriving. Uh, Llama 3 came out last week, and it's better than the original uh, ChatGPT, and it's much, much cheaper and much faster. So it's a, a really, really exciting time to be in the space. Great. Jed? Um, in the last year, <clears throat> Everything, but I think that what we've really, uh, the, the somebody who goes out and talks to our customers all the time, uh, it's it's been an evolution of use cases, like what Will was talking about. Uh, Will, I think you actually had a really great anecdote um, <clears throat> around the dangers of publicly, like having a publicly accessible LLM endpoint. Did you want to, could, could you talk a little bit about that? I, I think that you. Oh yeah, just, just the idea that people will find ways to exploit your endpoint. I think, I think the line was that having a, announcing that you have an LLM backed service that exposes the LLM to your users in 2024 is like announcing that you've built a web service on Windows 98 in 2024. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very good one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it, it, yeah, so I think, yeah, seeing people shift from all right, we need a chatbot, whether it's internal or external, to, oh, I want to apply this uh, as I would you know, any other tool in my analytics toolbox that just happens to be like really fantastic. Um, yeah, it, it's a new fantastic tool, and people are realizing that, rather than, oh, it's like this separate thing that's going to live completely outside of all the stuff I've built in the past. Um, William, when you talk about the LLM system, and I think, you know, as you're opening, you're, you're saying, yes, it has changed, but essentially ML systems, LLM systems, how do you see that in terms of kind of a technologist perspective of what has truly changed? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think, I think like, like I said, I think a lot of the challenges that we're seeing with LLMs that seem new are things people haven't thought about yet with ML because they're focused earlier in the process. And I think for a lot of organizations, ML is still something that's that's sort of has has limited applicability outside of the lab. People are still sort of getting ML into production, right? And that's why it's it's fun to be here and seeing a lot of people who are getting value out of ML in production. But I think with LLMs, it's so much easier to imagine how if you can get this technology to work, it will revolutionize something you do. And you don't, you don't have to explain it. People don't have to use their imagination that it's, it's much easier to understand than are the recommender system or you know, forecasting or, or a variety of other things that people would use ML for in production. Yeah, that's great. And I mean, from a marketer's perspective, we think about ML and whether it's digital advertising or whatnot, it's, it's been part of the industry. And yet when I see like the demo today with Kirsten and Valentina and how easy it is to prompt, just thinking about how can I do analysis, how can I democratize that across the teams, that's what's really exciting for me. And I think that's what's changed from kind of the business unit perspective. Um, all right. so. I'm gonna to go to our product folks. Uh, well, everyone here is, but I'll start with Jed and William. Um, when you think about tooling, what is sort of essential for organizations to think of as perhaps net new or net, net additive right now? You gotta buy a ton of GPUs. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> in seriousness, um, yeah, it, with tooling, I think I, talked about this before, but I can't remember. Um, you immediately need to start, well, you don't need to start making a decision. You, you are going to look at a couple different ways of deploying your LLMs. So you can deploy it on-prem. You can deploy it probably with the crowd, cloud provider that you're already paying for a bunch of other stuff. Or you can um, uh, pick it from a, 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 an ISV, like Anthropic or, uh, or OpenAI. And the, the choice between those three deployment options or access options for LLMs is going to be based on a combination of your risk profile, uh, how much money you're willing to spend, uh, and 
uh, what kind of application you're trying to build. So like, for example, if you're trying to build a multimodal application, uh, until very recently, the big API services didn't do image to text. Uh, however, um, some local hugging face models would do it. Uh, Lava, for example, which uh, TitanML integrated with uh, very nicely. Um, and so that that's like a very specific use case consideration in how you're picking out your uh, LLM. Uh, the reality is that no large enough company is going to make only one decision. Like no large, no big company that I work with right now is only running local models or even only running models with a single provider. Like I, very common use case would be like, oh, we have Bedrock for this, we have Azure Open AI for this, and then we're deploying these uh, hugging face models locally. So accepting that deciding between providers and locally hosting models is going to be a reality of your toolbox is, yeah, pretty critical for, for whatever comes next, whatever else you're building on top of those things. Um, I'm going to go to our boss. Do you have anything to add? And when you think about, you know, we talked earlier and you're like, it's not about like how I started or why I started Data IQ, but some of the tenants of what the platform is supposed to serve, the democratization of the latest technologies. When you think of Gen AI and tooling, um, yeah, what what would be sort of the core core uh, work, you know, kind of work streams or or um, products that people should consider? So I I really liked uh, William's presentation because it reminded me of uh, when I was young, which was a long time ago, <laughs> and the, um, like my first product recommender system. Uh, like when you start in data science, you build a product recommender system and you iterate, you try things on that, you are like randomly happy with the content, you try to understand that this thing is not working, but ultimately, after a while, usually too long, you understand that if you actually don't have the full, the full, a real target, the real feedback loop and so forth, you're just like iterating in the void, like in the desert. You're walking as a data scientist. And like you're so, so happy because you're also learning Python in the same way and reading papers about like whatever's matrix vectorization stuff, but like really you're just not progressing that well. And so as soon as you start having this methodology and this rigor to actually have those feedback loop and evaluation environment and so forth, you're actually making progress and you have actually way better chance to actually have an impact. But it takes you a while. It took you a while as a data scientist back 10 or 15 years or 20 years ago to do that. And that's, I think, what your presentation was about, William. I think that uh, when we are um, pushing Gen AI stuff, or actually whatever stuff, uh, to the enterprise, we kind of need all together to have the same rigor. Because there, there will be a hype cycle associated to Gen AI. Like, they'll be like, Hip, and like, like people will be like, oh, it's bad, those bots are not working, yada, yada, yada. There will be complaints. But so if we all together apply the, the right level of rigor into the application we've built, maybe this down side of the cycle will actually be very short because we will be able to actually showcase application that will providing that will be providing uh, lots of value. So I think that this environment, the full life cycle that you talked about, uh, is actually probably the, the most important thing to build. I actually have a follow-up question on that for any of the three of you. Sorry, I'm stealing your job, Ren. Um, <coughs> I think part of the part of the challenge with Gen AI and LLMs right now is what like metrics we should be using for that feedback loop. Like we don't really know. Like there's no R2 score or AUC for LLMs yet. Uh, have you seen any situations in the wild of people doing something effectively to actually like really measure without just reading all the responses uh, how how well an LLM is doing? So my preferred method is I like to break up the cycle. Most applications that you're building in the enterprise with LLMs are normally some kind of document processing, like RAG application, um, where you have a search component and then you have a generative component. And whenever I see our clients building it, we always recommend that that search component should be as transparent and as auditable as possible. So you should always know which documents uh, your model is picking from to say the relevant answers. And we tend to think that you should be able to give feedback on both the quality of the search results and the quality of the generation. So the quality of search results is just as easy as like building within UI, like 
yes, this was relevant, or no, this wasn't relevant. This obviously needs an education of users, which we haven't had before. And then for the generation part, uh, the best way that we've seen it being done in production is something close to like ELO scoring, if you're a chess player, where essentially you can just kind of uh, put multiple answers against each other and then you know the user can pick. Uh, but this d does require like a redesign of, of how we expect our users to interact with these products and actually the users are part of that scoring system. So they're like what I think are the most robust because actually it's the users that are giving you feedback, but it's difficult because you have to redesign your systems along the way. Really cool. Uh, any any other cool ideas, Will? Well, a lot of the things I've seen people doing successfully do involve humans giving a thumbs up or thumbs down. One thing that's sort of an interesting approach is I've looked at this DSPI framework uh, a lot, and I'm still trying to figure out what it's what it's most useful for. But one of the ideas that DSPI has is that you can define your metric in terms of another model evaluating your output, right? So that's sort of automating the human in the loop. Um, I like this idea in principle. I'm not sure. I, I personally have not gotten awesome results with the system in practice yet. Um, still working on it, but I think it's an interesting idea. I think it's the kind of thing that you know, if you have multiple models in a system, this might be a thing that you use, you know, an API-based model that you you can't run locally for mm -hmm. if if that gives you better better performance by by spot checking. That just sort of pushes. I mean, another layer of indirection, right? We can solve solve anything that way. I mean, I think you brought up the example of Spotify earlier, and when we think of like different tolerances or what we're actually wanting out of the, the output is it could, it's perfectly matched if it's constantly playing the same songs that you've already said you liked. However, you want some randomness, and so depending on the use case, like how do you also measure that tolerance? So I think that's also really exciting and interesting where it's very right brain how we also have to curate um, how we think about those measurements. Yeah. Jed, do you want to ask another question? <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> what am I worried about with this whole thing? Uh, <clears throat> I am concerned that as we start chaining LLMs together, and oh, actually, uh, uh, very much uh, in line with that is everybody's kind of pushing this concept, right? Or at least all the big databases are pushing this concept of like, all right, you're gonna throw all your data um, and then it's gonna know about your schemas and your column types and all your data sets across your, your entire database. And then you're gonna be able to ask like English language queries of it and you're gonna get back something like a chart or a, a data set or a result. Um, ideally with maybe like the SQL for it underneath the covers but I think there's a danger of lack of transparency there. And I'm wondering, I, I know it's not necessarily the responsibility of the, uh, of the folks who are, the, who are just who are running the models themselves, but how do you think that, you know, as, as L Gen AI starts doing a lot of this intermediate work, we can still make sure that it stays transparent? I have, I have a couple of thoughts on this, and like the database example, like like Miriam said about the search example, I think we, we have a lot of cases where the fact that LLMs can do a lot of things well enables us to sort of not think about the things that are hard to do no matter what, right? Like search is hard, relevant search is hard, database queries are hard, right? Like I, I spent some time as a graduate student doing um, developing systems in Prolog, which, which is really aging me, I'm sorry, but this is a logic language where you have facts and rules and you ask a question and you either get an answer or it just says no. And if, if it says no, you don't know if that's because your program was wrong <laughs> or because there really weren't any answers to your question. And similarly with the SQL database, like, hey, the, the cardinality for this, this join looks about right, <laughs> but are these, are these all the right tuples or not? And, and so I think that really, especially when you're getting into more subtle things like, um, like you know, using transitive closure in SQL or, or windowing queries or things where you know, you'd have to really scratch your head and think about is this right or not? Um, I, think, I think we need to have just like we need to have business metrics for our applications because it's hard to define model metrics, we need to have some sanity checks on the output of these queries, on the output of these search searches to know that they're sensible. 
Florian, do you think tools can also assist with this type of thing? So do you remember when I was interviewing uh, the kind of like uh, SQL questions I was asking? No? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I was asking questions about like SQL queries that were potentially ambiguous or uh, hard to debug, which is very silly as an interview questions, but in, in fact, it's actually hard, like uh, debugging or understanding the logic for uh, either simple or complex one is hard. So intuitively, if you can have hum real humans like Jed, young Jed, interview questions uh, <laughs> where they get it wrong, uh, it should probably not be, be uh, within one or two years that you can actually have a fully reliable text to SQL up to uh, solving all of the potential ambiguities, like the top five, whatever, you have like so many weird definition of it that you can get it subtly wrong that I think that's the kind of like edge cases. That being said, I do believe that you will have lots of uh, mundane questions uh, that will be served better and that potentially the way we will do BI in very soon will be very different at the same time. Uh, Miriam, you talked about different ways to access LLMs. Um, for folks here, and we've also been talking about differentiated AI and what that means, it doesn't always mean this or that. APIs are so easy to use, just plug in and go versus self-hosting. How can organizations or folks here think through sort of that choosing um, period or, or decision-making period? Yeah, I think it's a very good question, and Jed touched on it earlier as well, that you will end up using different ways of accessing your AI for different applications depending on what matters in that application. And broadly, the three reasons why you might want to choose to self-host is firstly control, so like data privacy um, or data sovereignty. Um, the second is scalability. So when you're deploying things on a really, really large scale, let's say you want to deploy something to thousands and thousands of users, there's costs and scale reasons why you might want to self-host. And the third one is customizability slash performance. So it might be the case that you're in a domain, very domain-specific um, area, and you need to be able to fine-tune, or maybe uh, you need uh, a, a model that you know, is just a bio model, for example, that is only available in open source. So these are the three main reasons why you might choose to self-host. And if none of those are true, then you probably shouldn't because it is like a little bit harder. Um, but there will be some applications where one of those three is relevant and you will pick to either self-host or maybe do some kind of hybrid uh, for those particular scenarios. And those kinds of use cases are far more prevalent in regulated industries. You'll ha have a bigger percentage that you'll need to self-host slash hybrid than you will if you're in a non-regulated industry. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And um, I think when we think of the marketplace as well, like it's absolutely burgeoning, but perhaps for the enterprise, we're going to see it become dominated by maybe a few very large established, or it might continue to be very, very specialized. Looks like Jed wants to answer this. <laughs> I hope it's gonna stay diverse. I think that's good for everyone if, it, if it, the diversity and competition is maintained. Uh, I think we, everybody who's used Google in like the last five years know that it's gotten worse, right? Because no one competes with it. I think we can all agree on that. Well, maybe not, but I think Google search has gotten worse. Uh, and even and at the beginning when Google was absolutely fantastic, that came out of intense competition in the search market. Uh, I, I, would, I hope that the competition continues here. And I think it will. It's, it's the array of capabilities and the array of different problems that can be solved with this stuff is pretty wide. Um, so yeah, I, ho I hope for continued uh, independent competition. Florian, what do you what do you think on that? You think do you think it'll stay it'll congeal or stay diverse? Oh, I think it will be. Well, I think it will stay diverse because uh, even if there are uh, uh, lots of progress on let's say text uh, uh, topics, you will have uh, all of the multimodality uh, type of models. So, meaning for a few years, and then you've got uh, all of the opportunities to build uh, smaller embedded models. So, meaning uh, at the end of the day, uh, we have like. Uh, three, four, five years of like, lots of fun. I think there's too much financial incentive for it to congeal. I think there are, there are too many very big players who want to slice this pie. Yeah, I think, I think we're gonna continue to see, and I think there's a, there's a vibrant open source or at least open weights community, mm -hmm. right? I think the interesting question is, 
where is the fundamental research going to be coming from? Are we going to get to a point where you can say, hey, I have an idea like, like a fee, right? A model that's small. And could it, what could it be good for? Like, could a small organization embark on that? Could they have the sort of expertise and capability to develop something like that? I think that's an interesting question. But I think there is going to be broad innovation in this space. I had one more. Uh, kind of kind of harking back to a little bit before. Uh, and I'll start with asking you, Florian. Do you think, all right, we used to have this job called data scientist. I don't know if anybody even calls themselves a data scientist anymore, but we used to, who, who is or was once called a data scientist in this room? Who's still called a data scientist in this room? All right, yeah, okay, good. We're still around somewhat, or we were, or I, I'm not anymore, but I was. Anyways, the question is, Everybody a year ago was like, oh, there's going to be this new job called prompt engineer. Oh my god, I think it's a skill. I meaning it's a skill because it's a, um, I think it's a skill you have to get to in many AI engineering or data science uh, related jobs, but also more and more in any kind of like a content design kind of job, like being a good prompt engineer because that's part of the design process because your design is about interacting with these kind of tools and it can be prompt engineering in the wide sense uh, today it's text but i think that graphic design will be also other types of prompt engineering i think this ability to interact with the system and move things around to to get the, those things done yeah but not a job yeah it's going to get quite meta i think you're going to need like prompt engineering to find prompts to find prompts but I agree. I think the marketplace will continue burgeoning because the use cases are very divergent. And depending on even organizations, where we talk about AI maturity or AI literacy, and depending on the teams, the organization um, units, or the persons, there's different parallel paths of usage. And um, I think one of the things that is is key around Gen AI is just getting it started, just executing and finding a balance of what are those quick wins that are those repeatable tasks that might take away that kind of mundane and, and just be able to deliver very, very quickly. And then what are the longer or medium term sort of moonshots? And so when we think about use cases, you know, what are the opportunity costs of not getting started today? Um, what are your thoughts, William? Yeah, I think I think the the cost of not getting started. Um, data science is a team sport, right? We, we 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 already agree on that. We established that earlier. It's also a participant sport, right? Like the only way to like if you want to get good at bike racing, you can you can train and do intervals, but you're only going to get better at bike racing by racing bikes, right? And I think you're only going to get better at building LLM systems by building LLM systems. So I think the, the opportunity cost is that everyone else who's trying this and failing is learning from their mistakes and you aren't, right? So what I think about in terms of use cases that are, that are sort of a good place to start is I think about some advice I got when I was an undergraduate intern, which was that if the intern doesn't set the lab on fire, you know, you pretty much had a success, <laughs> right? And, and I, I, I've had really great interns that I've had the opportunity and the privilege to mentor in my, in my career since then. But I've always sort of thought, well, let's find a project for these interns where if they do something great, they have an opportunity to shine. And in the worst case scenario, they don't burn down the lab, right? And I think that it's similar use cases make sense for LLMs and generative AI. Like find something where you have asymmetric upside and downside and where there's an easy way to keep things on the rails. Yeah, I, when I, most clients and prospects get this, but sometimes I'll, I'll be talking to a client and they're like, well, you know, we're going to spend the next six months deciding on which LLM we might want to start making oh a contract God. with. And I'm like, I just want to shake them. I'm like, what? No, you need to start this. Literally everyone else in your industry is doing this. I guarantee you. Like, just deploy a hugging face model locally. It's fine. Just start doing something. For the love of God, <laughs> uh, it is, it is, uh, yeah, I mean, you are missing out right now if you're not, if you don't have somebody doing this. You are behind everyone else in your industry, period. 
Yeah, I had a, a couple of interactions where they um, were waiting to get their, as, like they were opening up a, a brand new Azure tenant so they could get access to OpenAI, which is taking months, months to go through legal and compliance. It's like, if that's an issue, literally just download a hug and face model and start working with it. And it's by far the best way. What I often see people um, doing when they're first starting this is they start by trying to build a chatbot. Um, which almost always goes wrong because chatbots are really, really hard to build and they're incredibly difficult to get right. It's a good way to learn, but actually if, um, for first projects to like deliver value, um, there's a lot you can do around like semantic search and more rag-based applications. I mean, I, I don't want to quote you again, so do you want to quote yourself? No. I don't remember, so. You love being quoted, okay. Um, that I, I think Jed said at a panel we were on um, a couple of weeks ago that if you aren't trying to replace existing NLP models you have with um, generative AI or LLMs, uh, then you're probably missing a trick because just like a very, very easy switch can probably add 20 points to your performance. So like those kinds of applications, I've seen way better success than trying to build a chatbot, which is very hard. Yep, opportunity cost, just get started. Um, Florian. Anything to add around for folks here? We're really trying to drive usage of Gen AI, but the use cases that are driving that return on, on investment and return on AI, uh, do you have any kind of advice as, as people think about curating those use cases? Yeah, well, first is just get started. I think you got it. Um, okay. I think that the first use case is, um, well, in all of those, um, so. Part of the reason why nobody, well, fewer people are data scientists in the room is that people that were data scientists back a few years ago got promoted. Okay. So I think you're no longer called data scientist. And I think that, uh, from my perspective, the companies that um, did it well back then were companies where you had some uh, ambitious enough but doable use cases that were assigned to, aligned to a key aspect of the business and that were just working well with ML. And so in those teams, the people that were leading the charge were able just to bring their company to success and actually build their career on top of that. One or, one or two use cases. I think that some of it will also happen uh, with generative AI. And I think that the specific use cases will be use cases that are potentially not just chatbot per se, um, but uh, use cases where you can attach yourself to some actual automation in the business, actually measure this automation, be very rigorous into this uh, measure, and get there. And that it will be harder than uh, the first use case you want to build on top of GPT just to get started, but that's actually the use case that will uh, potentially change your company, your career, or whatever else. So while we have William here from NVIDIA, I think it would be a miss not to ask around how we should think about budgets and the cost of inference where we are today, um, what might change in a year, 10 years? Are, you know, what, do you see that trend having um, you know, efficiencies being gained? There you go. Yeah, wow, this is, this is such a wonderful and <laughs> difficult question, right? Because it's a dynamic system, right? Think about your computer over the last however long you've been using a personal computer. Your computer gets faster, software gets more demanding. <laughs> Right, like there, there you, you can't just take any, any one component of this in isolation. So let's look at what the inputs are to what it costs to do LLM inference, because I'm, I'm assuming inference is the main problem. We're gonna be doing more inference than model training in the long run. Um, well, one of them is the cost of compute capacity. So um, I have on good authority that Huang's law says that the number of floating point operations that you can do at a given price point um, doubles roughly every two years. I don't know exactly what the coefficients are there, but it's directionally correct, right? So you're getting a lot of additional compute capacity over time. I think with software, a really interesting thing we're seeing is that LLM inference is actually a super hard computer science and engineering problem. And Miriam can talk about this a lot more than I can, I'm sure. But like actually getting good utilization of your hardware, actually getting low latency, actually getting high throughput, you know, pick any two, pick any one, right? It's a, it's a really hard problem and we're continuing as a community, as an industry, we're continuing to discover a lot of new ways to do this. And people are coming up with some really creative solutions to solve for one of those axes. I think. 
So that's another aspect. And then the, the third thing is that as people become more comfortable with these technologies, the way you'll use them will change, right? So I mean, one thing is that anything that's gonna be a commodity component, anything that's gonna be part of a commodity component, the cost is gonna go to zero, right? But as you become more comfortable with what the capabilities of these models are, you're gonna say, hey, maybe I can use a small model that I fine tune, or I can use a small model that I augment the context with, with search and get those better results at a lower price point for a specific application. And that's, that's where having lots of models is gonna pay off. So I think the only thing I can say confidently is that the hardware you can buy tomorrow will be cheaper and faster than the hardware you can buy today. And it'll be better for the models you can run today and that the models you could run tomorrow, um, there will be a broader spectrum, right? There will be much more capable models and there will be much more you know, tiny specialized models for specific applications. Thank you. We are actually out of time. Um, so I think just as a final, what is meaningful about this moment for each of you? Um, for me, I think, you know, I've been in the tech space for some time and I've always wanted to work on tech or in a realm where, you know, there's that quote, good tech should be indistinguishable from magic. And I think that's truly where we are. And it's about an inclusionary practice that is, you know, on the horizon that we've already seen with Gen AI and the usage of proliferation last year. So that's what's meaningful for me. Pinging it to you, Will. Yeah, I think just going back to what I just said, right, there's so much computer science involved here, right? There's, there's so much actual like problems that, are, that you don't deal with in a mainstream enterprise every day come to the forefront and are interesting and important in this space. That's really exciting. I'm really enjoying seeing all of the use cases that people are coming up with. And I'm, very, I'm really hoping that in five, 10 years, we actually get the, the promise that everyone's been talking about of actually being able to do more creative and interesting uh, work. So yeah, that's what I'm excited about. I think that as an analytic practitioner, I was always frustrated that even if you build great insights and great models and great dashboards, ultimately you still, have, you still need humans to read it and you can afford them to read the dashboard. That's the frustration of analytics. Now we get to the point where maybe we could actually uh, threaten them to actually automate everything they need to do if they don't read the dashboard, thanks to generative AI. And that's exhilarating from, uh, as an analytic pr practitioner. Uh, I like that businesses are taking AI seriously. This has made everybody take it seriously, like r really actually, not just like have a little budget for data science on the side for people to do like fun projects, but like, okay, this is real. Consumers forced that too, which is really cool. AI for the last 15 years has been pushed by scientists to enterprise orgs that then like do AI on people without the people necessarily even knowing, right? Uh, and now it's people using everyday people using AI, and that's just, that's great. That's such a nice switch. It feels a lot less icky than the other way. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Find me during happy hour to give some analogies of this, because I'm an ana analogies lady. But um, thank you so much to our panelists.